All right. Well, if it's okay, if you don't mind, I think we'll make a start. Uh, so my name is Jeff Michaels, and I'm the IEN Senior Fellow at eBay. I'd like to welcome you to eBay's seminar series on U.S. foreign policy. The series is part of a joint initiative of eBay and the Barcelona Institute of North American Studies. It aims to promote discussion of U.S. foreign policy related topics by inviting both scholars and practitioners to share their research and provide their insights. This evening, it gives me enormous pleasure to welcome Michelle Murray, Associate Professor of Politics at Bard College in New York, who will be speaking on the topic of America First, Status and American Foreign Policy under Trump, as well as looking a bit at the, uh, the Trump legacy that the Biden administration has inherited and sort of where we're going from here. Just to give a bit of background, uh, Professor Murray's main topic of research is IR theory and specifically the issues of status and recognition, rising powers and great power rivalry. Two years ago, Oxford University Press published her book entitled, The Struggle for Recognition in International Relations, Status, Revisionism, and Rising Powers. She's also published a number of other articles and book chapters, and the topic of tonight's talk actually features both in a piece published by H. Diplo, uh, which is where I first came across her work, uh, and will also constitute a chapter in a forthcoming uh, edited volume, uh, edited uh, by, among others, sadly, the recently deceased uh, Robert Jervis. I must confess that a few hours ago, uh, as I was mentioning before, I watched a, a YouTube video of Professor Murray giving a talk a couple of years ago at the Carnegie Council for Ethics and International Relations and having also recently been working on sort of non-material and social aspects of power transition theory. Uh, I'm very anxious to, to get hold of your book as soon as possible. Uh, but I might need to take the liberty of asking one or two questions in the Q&A, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, anyway, so Professor Murray, welcome to eBay, uh, virtually at least, and I look forward to your presentation, which should be loading up in just a moment. Thank you, um, Jeffrey, for the wonderful introduction and for inviting me today to speak with you about some of my thoughts on status and U.S. foreign policy. Um, some of the, the thinking that I'll uh, talk about today comes out of this H. Diplo piece that I wrote um, over the summer about the effect of Trump on American foreign policy. And I'm now thinking about developing these ideas into a broader and, and bigger article. Um, I'm particularly interested in the relationship between friendship and recognition and between um, recognition, friendship, and international order. Uh, so kind of, I think, extending some of the research I did in my book um, to a kind of new area, uh, thinking um, ultimately about what kind of international order might look like over the coming years. Um, let me just... Where is the, I just want to, I'm not sure I'm seeing the slide. Uh, oh, there, yes. okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so the question I'm going to talk about today is, uh, how has the Trump presidency affected the status of the United States as the leader of the current international order? So when Donald Trump assumed the presidency in January 2017, I think almost everyone knew that his approach would be different um, and that he would be unlike American presidents that had come before him. He would not be guided by the same rules, norms, and priorities that had shaped U.S. foreign policy for at least half a century. Um, and he you know, this is kind of a, a, a defining characteristic of him as a political figure was his kind of bucking of tradition, his bucking of the kind of norms and values that sort of define traditional American politics. In one sense, when we look back, I think Trump's foreign policy was not a major departure. Um, you know, he there were no major wars. He did not. Um, use nuclear weapons, he did not abandon key allies wholesale, and the multilateral institutional framework in which the United States conducts most of its foreign policy remains in place. 
Nevertheless, the style and tone of his foreign policy was dramatically different. Uh, and many people may find this to be a small change, right? How he talked about and to allies, but I do think it was significant. Uh, and I think the ways in which he openly chastised allies, curried favor with dictators, and withdrew from important international agreements um, and questioned some very kind of symbolic agreements that are at the heart of the international order were, were significant and have had significant effects on U.S. foreign policy. And the claim that I make and what I'd like to argue today is that the effect of this diplomatic style and the choices that he makes has affected the United States in the world. And specifically, it has worked to make America unrecognizable to friends and allies. And this is important, I think, because the United States depends upon its friends and allies for its status in the system as the leader of the international order. As a result of his brash and, and um, kind of personalistic style, there are questions that have risen, arisen about the United States commitment to the values and norms that underpin American identity, as well as whether or not the United States is prepared to continue to be a leader of the international order. Um, I want to change the slide. I'm so sorry, I can't see the the little arrows. Okay. Well, um, so just a quick out. Sorry, to interrupt. Um, if, if you're having trouble with the slides, you just want to let you change the slides. I'll change them uh, for you. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'll just I'll just say that. Yeah. Um, uh, so a quick outline, I'm going to say a bit about status and in international order, um, sort, of, sort of an IR, a uh, quick IR theory tour on my thinking on that question. And then we'll look at uh, how Trump eroded, I will argue, eroded American status. And then we'll look at the Biden, first year of the Biden administration and whether or not he has been successful or if he's on a successful path and the questions that raises um, and that still remain for status in international order. Um, so the next slide, please. So status matters, I think, importantly in international politics because it is an expression of state identity and it's the means by which states can instantiate that identity in practice and pursue its foreign policy goals. So all states have self-understandings that are the basis of their identity. And these arise from domestic politics, their domestic discourses, their past interactions with states, their own personal histories. These self-understandings are subjective and they represent the role that a state wants to play in the international sphere. Status, I think, is a recognized identity in a social order. So states acquire status when their aspiring identity, that is the role that they want to play in international society, is recognized by other relevant states. Thus, enabling them to act enact their identities in practice. Um, and so, you, essentially, a state needs to have status. A state needs to be recognized, right? You can't have status on your own. You can't have status by yourself. It's an intersubjective process. It's something that happens between actors and their interactions with each other. When a state's desired role in the international sphere is recognized, particularly when we're talking about great power politics, it legitimates that state's power. When power is legitimate, there is a general perception or assumption that the actions of an entity are desirable, proper, or appropriate within some socially constructed system of norms. So as a consequence, Status recognition, I think, organizes interstate relations in such a way that particular states are authorized to play specific roles. The United States' role is the leader of the international order. 
The roles that states take on acquire meaning, as I said, through their interactions with other states that reproduce relations of recognition, right? So that reproduce that recognized identity, that reproduce that role identity in the system. These routinized encounters make states recognizable to each other and in turn make the interactions between states predictable and stable. And next slide, please. International order, I think, is a kind of social order that arranges states' relationships with each other and guides their behavior through routinized relations of recognition. So at the center of this order, of any international order, is the leading power who defines the rules, the values, the norms of the system. Indeed, when a state is recognized as the leader of the order, it is able to order that system in ways that serve its interests, right? So this is not a kind of self-interest versus status argument. It's that status is a, is a means by which states can pursue their own interests. And indeed, right, the, the, the so-called liberal international order serves the United States material interests in really important ways. So key to the leading power's status is the recognition that it receives from its friends and closest allies. And this particular form of recognition is important because these actors share a common vision of international order and they make a commitment to maintain it into the future. Friends identify with each other on the basis of their shared history and experience, a common set of values and priorities, and a faithfulness to a shared project of world building that reproduces the order and the status hierarchy that goes along with it. So in this context, the relationships that the leading power has with its friends and the relations of recognition that sustain those relationships are the pr principal ways and means by which uh, status in the system is created and reproduced. Put simply, being a good friend is key to maintaining friendship and is key to maintaining standing in the world. Um, team play, I think, is one of the ways in which those routinized relations of recognition happen and reproduce themselves and reproduce the order, right? You're, you're kind of acting as a team, you're acting as a collective, you're, act, you're acting as um, participants in a kind of common project. And, you know, what team play is, is a variety of foreign policy practices. These are both strategic things and symbolic things. They are formal membership in organizations. They're informal diplomatic encounters. They happen in language, the way that leaders talk to and about each other, and they happen in practice, right, what leaders do. Um, and so all of these kinds of components of team play essentially reiterate and reinforce the collective identity of the group and in turn reiterate and reinforce the status of the leading power in the system. So next slide please. So both of Trump's rhetoric and foreign policy decisions, I think, called the um, idea of team play into question. From the start of his presidency, Trump targeted the international institutional order, um, withdrawing from or significantly cutting funding to a range of organizations. Um, he started a trade war with the European Union, and I think really significantly questioned the U.S. commitment to NATO. Um, these organizations all spanned, were kind of variously connected to, to U.S. strategic interests. So, you know, not everything was at the core of U.S., uh, was a kind of core interest of the United States. Um, but what they together reflect is a kind of broader disdain for that institutional element of the international order that the United States leads. Perhaps best captured by the America First slogan, 
the guiding principles behind Trump's foreign policy were from the start transactional, right? Defined by momentary exchanges of often economic self-interest, right? This helps to explain his fascination and fixation on NATO dues, for example, right? He wants to know who's paying what to fund NATO, not thinking about the broader context in which NATO operates. Um, next slide, please. So what is particularly noteworthy about America First is not the notion that the United States would pursue its own interests, right? There is no claim here that the United States is by any means an altruistic actor in the international system, um, or that its interests have to be in sync and um, coincide with the interests of its, its most important allies, right? Friends don't agree on everything. Friends have differences of opinion. Um, but rather, it was the kind of rhetorical and discursive work that the America First approach to foreign policy did. Um, and in particular, it undermined the collective sentiments at the heart of team play. And it suggested that the United States valued its allies only insofar as they benefited its immediate material interests. Um, in this context, then, the United States and the values that it represented were framed as in many ways oppositional to Europe and to European um, allies. So Trump often referred to NATO as obsolete and questioned whether the United States should promise to defend countries that were quote unquote delinquent on meeting targets for military spending. Um, seemingly reducing the defense organization, which for many sits at the heart of the international order. So it has a very important symbolic role, um, if not actually institutional role, to zero sum economic exchanges, that, that NATO was simply about cost sharing. Um, G7 meetings often devolved into spats about retaliatory tariffs and trade wars, right? And so there was sort of little progress that could be made on thinking about global economic matters um, because Trump was, you know, fixated on um, these, these kind of trade wars that he had with, with European allies. Um, next slide, please. Now, this kind of tough talk and kind of tough approach to its allies happened at the same time that Trump was embracing illiberal values in other foreign leaders. Um, he embraced leaders like Kim Jong-un, um, Vladimir Putin, uh, he accommodated them, right? Uh, he spoke of them as friends, right? So he, he spoke of, you know, Putin in very, very um, positive and, and approving terms, right? His um, infatuation almost with Kim Jong-un um, was kind of different than, than leaders that came before. Um, and so if it's that juxtaposition, right? It's the kind of way in which he talked about sort of historic American allies and then an embrace of what we might call kind of current American adversaries, right? At the same time. And those adversaries in general embraced kinds of sets of illiberal values, right? Um, they dis disregard democratic governance, human rights, freedom of the press, the rule of law. Um, they suppress political opposition. They have a penchant for violence, right? These are all kinds of things that the U.S. does not openly associate itself with. Um, at the same time, he also condoned their um, illiberal actions, right? Um, and so when uh, Turkish President Erdogan ordered his security detail to attack protesters outside of the American or the Turkish embassy in Washington, D.C., Trump offered no public condemnation of that. Um, perhaps most shockingly, some would say the um, when Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman authorized the brutal killing and dismemberment of Jamal Khashoggi, a U.S. based journalist and U.S. permanent residence. Um, Trump specifically contradicted his own intelligence community 
uh, to say that the cause of the death would never be known. Um, likewise, in the picture, you see him meeting with Kim Jong-un um, to discuss negotiations about his nuclear program. And here, right, it's not that Trump was negotiating, right? That's not the issue. It's the kind of manner in the symbolic fields in which he was conducting those negotiations, right? Which offered um, Kim Jong-un a kind of status as a legitimate statesman in the system. Um, what makes this different, right? It's not, you know, Trump is not the first US president to embrace or work with autocrats. Um, I think what it is was his outward admiration for these leaders, um, combined with the lack of strategic interest in in that admiration, right? And so it seemed to keep, be genuine in a, in, in a way that, that was problematic. Next slide, please. Um, finally, there is the undermining of democracy at home. Um, so Trump has did and continues to deny the legitimacy of the election. Uh, he tried to marshal federal resources to change election outcomes. He tried to bully state level um, politicians to overturn the votes that were cast um, for Joe Biden. He's used rough met methods to suppress protest. Um, perhaps most notably using tear gas to clear a protest outside the White House in summer 2020. Um, and he, from the start of his campaign, delegitimized and threatened the press, right? Um, on top of that, he has at, at multiple moments had open identification with white nationalist groups, um, which is a problem for the leader of a multi multiracial democracy. Um, so when there were white nationalists marched in Charlottesville at the beginning of his presidency, he said there were very fine people on both sides when um, a kind of counter protester was killed. Uh, likewise, in the picture there, you see the insurrection on the Capitol on January 6th. He said these were peaceful people. These were great people. Um, and so the identification with these types of groups um, kind of erodes the democratic nature. And indeed, you see many experts um, talking about the uh, um, kind of democratic backsliding in the United States, I think as a, a, a symptom of Trumpism uh, and his, his leadership. Uh, next slide, please. So what, where does this leave us? Um, the unusual style and tone of Trump's approach to foreign policy, I think, has eroded American standing in the world, and it has done so because it has rendered unstable representations of American identity, right? The U.S. during Trump's presidency was not friends with the states that we had historically been friends with, and we seem to want to be friends with the states we had historically been adversaries with, like along with kind of declining liberal values at home. This had the effect of making the United States unrecognizable to its friends and its allies. Uh, therefore, it's no surprise that a key element of Joe Biden's foreign policy and a, a key priority for him has been to rehabilitate these relationships and restore America's standing in the world. In his first address before a global audience at the Munich Security Conference in February 2021, Biden wholeheartedly declared, America is back. The transatlantic alliance is back. Drawing a clear distinction between his intended approach to foreign policy and that of his predecessor. This echoed remarks he made a few weeks earlier on America's place in the world, where he charged American diplomats at the State Department to, quote, begin reforming the habits of cooperation and rebuilding the muscle of democratic alliances that had atrophied over the past few years of neglect and abuse, end quote. Biden moved swiftly to restore America's participation in many of the treaties and organizations that Trump had abandoned rejoining the Paris Climate Agreement, re-engaging and refunding the World Health Organization. He's reasserted the United States commitment to democratic values at home and abroad, and on the latter has taken tougher stances with Russia, Turkey, and China on these issues. Next slide, please. 
While Biden's foreign policy does represent a distinct shift in tone, and there was almost euphoria at the beginning of his presidency, I think, for the kind of return of America or America being back, I do think that the effects of four years of the Trump presidency and an America first foreign policy persist. And I think it's not something that can just be tackled with a new person in the Oval Office. Um, for example, European allies were really troubled by the chaotic withdrawal of American troops from Afghanistan and the quick, seemingly unanticipated fall of Kabul into tal Taliban control, which for them raised serious questions about the sincerity of Biden's commitment to global engagement and consultation. Afghanistan was the first mission in NATO's history to emerge from invoking Article 5, the collective defense pact at the heart of the NATO's founding treaty that binds its members together and sets a spirit of solidarity within the alliance. NATO allies beyond this invested heavily in Afghanistan in both blood and treasure as part of their commitment to the alliance and to the shared international order that it symbolizes. For Biden to order the withdrawal of American troops from Afghanistan without adequately consulting European partners in the decision signify to many that the foreign policy is more in line with America first and America is back. Likewise, when the United States and Britain announced a deal to help Australia build nuclear powered submarines to counter growing Chinese power in the Pacific region, leading which led Australia to renege on a promise to buy French built submarines. French leaders were angered that they were not part of these discussions, or at the very least not notified beforehand. As an act of protest, French, French President Emmanuel Macron recalled the ambassador to the United States and the French foreign minister described the deal as unilateral, brutal, unpredictable, and compared it to the erratic decision making typical of the Trump administration. Indeed, an editorial in Le Monde made the issue at stake clear, quote, for anyone who still doubted it, the Biden administration is no different from the Trump administration on this point. The United States comes first, whether it's in the strategic, economic, financial, or health field. America first is the guiding line of the foreign policy of the White House. Uh, taken along with the withdrawal from Afghanistan, this episode suggests a pattern of genuine lack of consultation with allies and provoked a broader perception in the world of American dismissiveness in its foreign policy. Um, and I think this goes along with some other things that are happening on the kind of domestic side of foreign policy. So, so Joe Biden's um, positions on immigration, for example, on the southern border, there's there's very little difference between um, Trump and, and Biden. Biden has a softer tone, but the policies themselves stay the same. Um, likewise, on vaccine nationalism, right, Biden is clear that, that America first in terms of vaccines, um, and so only after that will we consider vaccinating the world. And so I think there is really still a very strong current in Biden's um, foreign policy that, that really resembles um, and reflects the American for America first way of thinking. Um, next slide, please. So to kind of finish up, um, I think, right, these, these things I'm talking about are in some ways trivial, right? Submarine deals and whatnot, right? Not a lot is sort of at stake in that. But I also think that the stuff of foreign policy are these kinds of inconsequential encounters with allies who are the basis of the US um, position in the world. And so how does the United States recover from Trump, right? Obviously, I think Biden shows that just changing tone isn't enough, right? That there has to be more substance, substantive and um, intentional engagement to happen. Um, it raises the question for me of whether or not Trump was an anomaly or did he just simply make undeniable something that had always been there within US foreign policy, right? And so did the change in tone actually kind of reveal what, what has always been the case? 
Um, and then the question of simply how to make America recognizable again. Um, how do we do that? What would it take? Um, how would US foreign policy change? Um, and with that, I am looking forward to your questions. Uh, Michelle, uh, Michelle, thank you so much mm -hmm. for that excellent presentation. Uh, at this point, we have about um, just under half an hour for some questions. Uh, if you do have any questions, uh, you can answer them to the chat box or raise your hand and we can arrange for you to speak. Uh, the chat box you can find if you go to the lower right hand side of your screen, uh, the little purple icon with the arrows. If you just click that, uh, open that up and then the icon uh, on the far left, the bottom far left. Uh, and then you can enter any questions you have into that. Um, I mean, just as sort of an initial reaction, if I might, uh, and sort of I'll sort of give a, a reaction to your 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 your, your talk, and perhaps you could have any any sort of comments, reactions. I mean, sort of one one thing that always struck me, uh, there seems to be some sort of phenomenon in in, in international affairs of of getting attention equals status. Um, being in the news, in a sense, gives one status. Uh, you might see this perhaps, you know, sometimes referred to if North Korea uh, conducts a missile uh, uh, test or a nuclear test, or if, uh, as we saw uh, you know, earlier this year, to say nothing of the moment with Russia and Ukraine, for example, with a big military exercise or something like this, you know, remember that we're here, we're a big power, um, and so forth. Uh, but you know, one thing that struck me about Trump, um, you know, one word that he used, I think more than any other word, was ratings. I mean, quite, you know, he didn't use the word status, but he used the word ratings. I mean, for him, it was all about the ratings. Was he on TV? Was he being listened to? Uh, you know, and all of that. And, you know, if there was one feature of the Trump administration that I found sort of interesting, I don't sort of have any stats to prove this one way or the other, is that whereas sort of during the Obama period or, or Bush or whatever, uh, previous administrations where the U.S. tended to be responding to crises happening, happening elsewhere, during the Trump administration, it was the U.S. that was creating the international crisis. Uh, it seemed like every single day was a new uh, crisis. Um, now, sort of having said that, um, you know, when you think about status and ratings and, uh, I'm sort of just curious because, you know, you talked about the change from Trump to Biden. And of course, you saw the same thing with the change from George W. Bush to Barack Obama, which was this overnight massive shift in terms of international popularity. You know, but at the same time, you know, the way, you know, if the U.S. is liked or not, is, is that really about if the U.S. president is liked or not? And when we talk about status, is that the same thing as likability? And you know, do we measure that via, you know, opinion polls, or, you know, the Chicago Global Survey, or whatever it's called, uh, things like that? So I'd just be curious about your reaction uh, to this issue. Yeah. So um, I would say a couple of things. One, in my other work, I I talk about the the fact that status is intersubjective, right? So you can't have status by yourself. You need others, you need other folks to, to participate in, they, they need to recognize you, right? And so they need to kind of participate in the image of yourself that you're, you're drawing for the world. Um, the example I use is, my mom can think I'm the best IR theorist that has like ever lived, but that doesn't matter, right? Like I need the right people to see me that way, otherwise, you know, it doesn't matter in terms of my, you know, life as a professor. Um, and the same thing is true of states, right? So one of the things, and, and that, that's, that's a very insecure state of being, right? Because your status, the kind of confirmation of who you are, depends upon others who may or may not recognize you. And so one of the things that I I um, argue in my book is that the way that states respond to this is by putting on these spectacles um, and building kind of exemplary military power. So they build big things like battleships and nuclear weapons and kind of things that kind of say, see, look at me, I'm powerful. Look at me, I'm a player. Um, and what that does is it provides them with a kind of fleeting sense of the status they want. And it's tragic in the end because it doesn't give them the recognition they want, but it provides a kind of temporary, 
um, a, a kind of temporary, it solves temporarily the problem of inner subjectivity. Um, and so something that I have always grappled with with Trump is that he as a person is extremely insecure, right? And so there's a way kind of interpersonally that the argument I make about states makes sense for him, right? So he puts on these kind of spectacles because he just sort of wants attention all of the time. Um, and I think one of the questions for me just as an IR theorist that Trump's presidency raises is the kind of role of leaders as kind of distinct from the way in which constructivists sort of anthropomorphize the state as a person, more or less. Um, and he calls that into question, I think, right? That, that it really was kind of about him um, getting attention. And so it made sense for him interpersonally, even if it undermined US interests overall, right? He liked the spectacle in North Korea because it got ratings, right? He said that, right? It got ratings and the ratings were so good. Everyone watched it. Um, but I think you're you're right that, well, I, I think kind of two things about just like sort of who the president is and if the president is liked or not. Um, I think in general, until Trump, US foreign policy and, and our president they differed a lot from one another, but they stayed within a kind of discursive lane and they could be kind of more or less to one side and they could value different things differently, but they were sort of within this kind of boundary that we understood um, to be US foreign policy, at least discursively. And I think one of the things that Trump disrupted is that he kind of just scrambled that entirely, right? And so I do think the kind of way a president talks not his popularity necessarily, but the kind of ways in which he talks about U.S. foreign policy and U.S. interests in the world and the ways in which he would engage allies. So even George W. Bush is unpopular because, you know, people didn't like the war in Iraq. He still, like the kind of relationships with allies, I think were still more or less maintained, or at least they were maintained in enough spaces that it didn't kind of collapse the whole thing. And, and similarly with with Barack Obama, right? He, everyone liked him discursively because he was very kind of pro engagement with the world order yet that makes things like the drone war possible, right? So he, he does things that are sort of the same as Bush or worse, but people don't recognize it for what it is. Like that's the kind of work that status does for a leading power. It kind of legitimates their power. It gives them the benefit of the doubt. Um, so I don't think it's so much like whether the president is liked or not, but sort of the discursive environment in which the president as a kind of very important speaker for US, for the United States articulates, you know, a vision for the, the international order, but also kind of reflects values and, and ideas that are at the heart of US identity. No, thank you. And the, the comment that you made about um, North Korea in particular, uh, I remember seeing this term, which I never come across before, but I think captures it quite well, uh, diplotainment, where basically you're holding this big media spectacle of an, of, of an event where you're not really going to achieve anything, but purely having the event itself gives you, you know, all the attention, all the eyes are on you, um, which is certainly in the case of the two summit meetings with uh, Kim Jong-un seem to seem to bear that out somewhat. I was also thinking in, in sort of reaction to what you were saying, uh, not only sort of battleships, aircraft carriers and so forth, but you know, military parades, you know, whether it's, yeah. uh, you know, I mean, Trump wanted his big military parade uh, in Washington. Of course, we see the same thing with, with Russia and their May Day parades or Victory Day parades and uh, North Korea mm -hmm. with its parades and so on and so forth, mm -hmm. China with its parades, um, which is so- but every, You know, even Trump, right, got the idea when he visited France oh, and, and yes, exactly. Bastille Day, right? And he yeah. thought, oh, we need to do this here. Um, but I think, you know, I, like I said, I'm, I, I, I think it's unusual that the, that the leading power would be th this kind of status insecure, right? That the leading power kind of flexes its muscle in a more sophisticated way because it's defined 
it's defined world order that serves his interest. Like this is the kind of Brooks and Wolfworth art, um, argument, right? That the mm -hmm. kind of US order, the, that the international order is structured in such a way to reproduce American power. And so it's quizzical that, that you know, it didn't, that he couldn't kind of work with it through this kind of subtle ways in which the US ruled the world through these institutions, right? The US is ruling the world no matter what. Um, but, you know, he wanted the spectacle. And I, you know, I just can't, I, in my mind, I don't know if that's just his own personal psychology or if it says something kind of deeper about a tenuous, tenuousness of American identity and status. I'm, I'm just not sure. Yes, I mean, um, having sort of studied his earlier rhetoric uh, going back to the 1980s and continuing on through the 1990s and when he was also running for president in the early, was it 1999, 2000, uh, as well, looking at some of those speeches, actually, it's basically the same lines being repeated over and over again. Uh, so essentially lines from the 1980s he's still using in the you know, 2010s, um, which I always found. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe because he just remembered them or something like this, but uh, just <laughs> same sort of theme, so good one-liners that go with it. So, um, I mean, a, make, uh, make America Great Again is a really unusual slogan, right, for kind of, for American exceptionalism, because the, the, what you're saying, actually, when you say make America great again, is America isn't so great right now, which I think yes. really is not within the discursive world in which basically every other president, um, and really many of the American people have operated for a long time. Yes. I mean, the, um, you know, I find it interesting that during the last election, uh, sort of switching from make America great again to keep America great again. Uh, of course, now that uh, Biden's in charge, they can go back to the old MAGA, uh, I suppose, for the right. next election. That actually, that actually brings me to the, uh, Adam's question. Uh, he asks, um, any thoughts if there's a future Trump 2 administration, uh, for example, any similarities or differences to Trump 1 in terms of he might take off where he left off? Yeah, um, I think it's a real possibility um, for a Trump to administration. And honestly, the thing that worries me most about that is what happens in the domestic sphere. Um, like I said at the end, you know, there's arguments about democratic backsliding in the United States, and you see a lot of really kind of illiberal authority, authoritarian impulses running through American politics right now. Um, you know, changing local election laws so that certain officials can essentially override the votes, can can send different slates of electors to Congress. Um, and so I, I do worry kind of first and foremost what that means for the United States in the domestic context. I, I, I think he would in some sense pick up where he left off, which would be to continue to erode the the norms and maybe even the rules that that govern american politics um internationally i think um i think it would be a stress test on the things that i've been talking about so you know four years of kind of berating allies and talking down the liberal international order um i think is it, it did enough damage i think biden is not you know handling that damage and, and, and offering enough of a substantive change to it. I think, you know, four more years of that would continue to erode all of the um, routinized relations of recognition that I think America's position in the world depend upon. And of course, that would be happening at a moment when China is assuming a greater place in the world. Um, and so that would be actually, I think, the one area that I would worry quite a bit about. Joe Biden is certainly not good, I don't think, on China. But um, I think Trump has a much more, for all of these reasons we were just talking about, has a much more kind of um, impulsive way of doing foreign policy. And I would worry about that in the context of a really kind of powerful rival who was in a position to challenge more forcefully U.S. power in the world and to do that in a moment when allies are not sure that the United States is still an ally anymore. So I think it could actually be a really crucial moment for China and its rise to power in the system. Yes, I mean, one theme. A second that, Trump presidency. 
one thing that I'm, I'm sort of always uh, reminded of, um, you know, I mean, I think perhaps initially after the events of January 6th and certainly after Biden was actually physically in office, uh, perhaps the idea, at least perhaps for the first couple of months that, okay, well, the, you know, Trump will never, you know, Trump's finished politically or something like this, but that seems to have eroded fairly quickly. And with that, perhaps the anxiety that actually, no, he, he has a strong chance of coming back in you know, four years time. And therefore we know the whole notion that actually we would actually have a democratic administration for probably eight years. Um, that's looking increasingly unlikely. Maybe that'll change, but you know, at least for the moment, there's a lot more anxiety than there was perhaps after, you know, during those first couple of months after Biden got into office and how that, that might affect foreign policy decisions, willingness to, um, uh, I don't say accommodate uh, uh, you know, Chinese preferences or something like this or not, but to hedge more than they might otherwise wish to do. I don't yeah. know if we've seen evidence of that yet or not, but perhaps closer to the election, depending on what the, what the rate, what the polls what yeah. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, cause uh, I, I mean, I do think Biden is a hawk, right? He's a hawk on China and he's not going to go to war with China. He's that stupid. But, I, you know, I, I don't think he's he's more on the containment end of the containment engagement binary. So, yeah, I think it would be interesting to see what sort of happens as we get closer to 2024 and have a better sense of sort of where what things look like. I could just sort of follow up a bit on the, the you know, when you talked about being a team player, uh, I mean, to what extent do you find that U.S. allies have a stake in American status and are willing to um, take actions to preserve uh, American status? I mean, you know, um, I mean, during the Trump years, for example, when there was all this talk about, you know, as you mentioned, NATO, for instance, or uh, defense budgets, I mean, <clears throat> you know, they wouldn't probably increase them to, uh, you know, the extent to which Trump was demanding, but they would at least try to make some movement, at least mm -hmm discursively saying, well, we're going to do something a bit differently and we'll say, thank you very much, Mr. Trump, for, uh, for telling mm -hmm. us to do this or for asking us to do this. Now we're finally doing this after we said that we would have done this before and or, 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 or something to this effect, basically playing along with Trump on the understanding or on the, on, on the hope is probably the better way of putting it, that he would be a one-term president and that they could sort of just ride out Trump and sort of get back to quote unquote normality. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm curious how how what you thought about that. I mean, I mean, having lived, um, you know, in the UK, for example, for you know a, a decade and a half in my case, you know, the notion of a special relationship and so forth, and maintaining this at all costs, um, and you sort of see this with some other countries with respect to NATO as well. Uh, I mean, I'm just, I'm just curious yeah. uh, how these sort of dynamics play out. I mean, I think one of so one of the things that team play does is it it helps reproduce those relations of recognition that are necessary for U.S. status um, and for the and therefore for the international order itself to exist, right? Um, and so I think there is a sense in which like you kind of write it out to kind of get get through it. Um, but what what Trump's kind of disavowal for lack of a better word, of team play or his kind of rejection of team play. I think what that does, and even if it is in the kind of insignificant stuff, right? He, he didn't leave NATO, for example, right? But by insulting leaders and threatening all the time and, and, and those kind of things, right? He's, he's kind of undermining the predictability that an international order creates, right? That, that, that's, that's why European allies want it, right? Is that we share the same goals and this creates a kind of predictable world in which we can live and exist. Um, and so what I would worry about with a kind of second Trump administration is whether or not Europe, like would the United States be so unrecognizable that it could no longer count on us at all, right? And then it starts to make its own decisions and its own self-interest. I mean, you see some of that with, China and, and Europe's kind of thinking about China, which I think diverges somewhat with the United States. Um, so, the, so, so it's really I think those kind of relations of of those routinized relations of recognition that 
that would be undermined. And when those are undermined, then you don't have kind of predictability and stability in the international order itself. And so at that point in time, you have to start thinking about, you know, where do you fit in? How do you guard and protect against your interests? Um, and what would that require? So, you know, I could see a further kind of crumbling of institutions um, precisely because the, the relations of recognition that they depend upon just wouldn't be there anymore. Mm. No, I can definitely, uh, I can definitely appreciate that. Uh, I mean, one of the things I was curious about at the time, uh, I mean, there were all these questions, as you, as you pointed out, would the U.S. or would, would Trump try to get the U.S. out of NATO? Uh, on the other hand, the other sort of the alternative to that would be would other countries just want to withdraw uh, right. of their own volition because they simply see no value in it. Uh, now, that seems right. unlikely for a variety of reasons. Um, not the least of which is that the status quo always seems to be the preferred option. Uh, and it's sort of right. difficult to think about what sort of crisis would actually drive them to such an extreme action. Um, and sort of how long the status quo can be maintained and sort of what do you actually have to do to push the boundaries too far. Uh, I mean, this was always seems to me that the, the question about Trump was he was, he always seemed to be going very, very close to those boundaries or pushing the boundaries like, you know, the, the, the previous boundaries he definitely crossed over them, but it just, it just sort of widened the boundaries more generally. Uh, people were more willing to accept a widening of the boundaries, but sort of at what point does it cross over uh, to the right. point where it's, you just can't go any further? Um, and at what point I mean, does an adversary see that, right, and press on it, right? Like, so, so crises aren't just sort of self-made, right? What, at what time does Russia sort of look at that and press? I mean, maybe it's doing it right now, I don't know. Um, but kind of create that crisis moment where they have to think about, you know, do we need to withdraw? Do we need to do create something new? Like, can we count on the U.S.? Like, it, it those crisis moments would sort of really highlight the precarity of the commitment. I mean, one thing that I'm also curious about because you know we've been talking about China, for example, and, and Trump, but just to go a bit earlier into history, I mean, during the Cold War, for example. Um, you know, in the case of Vietnam, for instance, uh, I don't know if you're sort of familiar with Hannah Arendt's uh, The Politics of Lying, where she's interrogating the Pentagon Papers and basically making the argument that, you know, the reason why the U.S., effectively the reason why the U.S. was in Vietnam was over its image, that this was an image mentality, it was about its status, that there was this concern, this, this ideology, if you will, uh, amongst policymakers that you couldn't do anything to undermine U.S. status in the world and therefore you just had to stay in Vietnam uh, for status reasons. And, and as we've seen, as you've said also, with Afghanistan, uh, that's also been interesting. I, I sort of was curious with Biden when he gave his speech in mid-August, mid sorry, mid-August, um, you know, amidst the fall of Kabul, um, basically saying why the U.S. was not going to intervene at that stage. And then sort of having read his speech back in April, uh, where he talked about his withdrawal policy in sort of vague terms, but you know, sort of laying it out. Um, you know, one thing that struck me, uh, I hadn't really appreciated, but then reading afterwards his speeches in, I think it was like June and July, which, he, you know, he'd been, make, he'd been basically making the same sort of case that he makes in August, but I don't think anybody was really paying attention in the same way because they were just, you know, it wasn't as dramatic at the time. But he, he essentially making the claim that the U.S. should have gone out of Afghanistan 10 years ago, that basically everything that's happened since then was a, a waste of time, uh, that the U.S. could mm -hmm. probably not have done what it did even, uh, you know, after 9-11 in quite the same way that it did, and uh, sort of a rebuke of the Obama administration's policy in, in sort of coded language, um, to say the least. But, you know, the, but the point was, was that, he was making the claim that the U.S. stayed in Afghanistan for the status reasons. It couldn't be seen to lose Afghanistan. This is sort of the ultimate uh, defeat. And you know, just as you saw in the case of Vietnam, some allies at the time afterwards saying, well, this is going to undermine the U.S. reputation and so forth. And you saw this certainly at the time of the fall of Kabul as well. Uh, but then it seems like two weeks later, it's back to normal again. So, so you have this sort of perception of the undermining of U.S. credibility, but it has a very short shelf life. Yeah. I mean, I do think one of the things that I noticed 
within him kind of rhetorically, I mean, there was some self-reflection, but there was also a sort of sense that like Afghanistan couldn't be saved, right? We shouldn't have ever tried to save this place that couldn't be saved. Like, and so there was a, a way in which the failure was blunted, um, right? So, so, you know, we couldn't be seen to, to be losing Afghanistan. I think that's definitely true, but also at the same time, like we couldn't, there was nothing more we could have done, right? Afghanistan is not savable. And so we had to, to pull back. Um, I also think that like US, US politics is just so, like the attention span is just so small now. Like, you know, we think about something for, and this probably has to do with like the way in which news media operates, but and I think that's an interesting question is how status really works in this kind of environment where you're not getting the international news, you know, at 630 every night from Walter Cronkite, but it's kind of a constant <laughs> flurry news cycle. And then like you, you basically are onto something else in, in, in two weeks. And so I, it's an interesting question. I don't know the answer to like, how does that, does that well, I mean, just, just, I mean, just crazier just, just behavior, just, or well, I mean, one thing that struck me, you know, I, I sort of feel like, you know, now that I'm reaching the age where, you know, uh, I sort of remember 9/11, but my students have no knowledge about it whatsoever right. because they're young to remember. And I'm sort of feeling the age at this point, but you know, to understand the anxiety of you know, the declining power, uh, you know, I mean, what sort of evidence? is used, I mean, the reason I'm curious about this in sort of relation to China and this point that you raised before about attention span is because, you know, if you look back over the course of the post-Cold War period, you know, there seems to be these waves of anxiety about China. I mean, first in the 1990s, during the latter half yeah. of the Clinton administration, uh, then around 2011 with the, the pivot to Asia, then again after Trump came into office. And in this sense, the anxiety about a rising China has, you know, it's been in the background for quite some time, although it seems a lot worse now than it has been in the past. I mean, presumably because you know, over the course of this period, the U.S. has gotten relatively weaker compared to China. So perhaps there is a greater degree of anxiety. But sort of I wonder, you know, like can the U.S. shift away from China as it did with terrorism after 9-11 or Russia for a few years after 2014? Or, you know, is China here to stay? Um, what can actually distract the U.S. for at least a few years, if that? Yeah, I, I thought, so, so when I was presenting at Carnegie, I was sort of thinking about this question and I thought, you know, something like climate change, right? Some kind of existential threat that really demanded collective thinking, um, maybe would, would, would potentially be a vehicle through which the U.S. could recognize China and China could recognize the United States and maybe kind of something could be created. Um, the pandemic has sort of made me doubt that <laughs> that possibility, right, that that othering is just too strong, um, in part because I think there's this long history, right? We don't, we're not coming at China today from the, just from the perspective of today, right? We're coming at it with decades of representation and discourse that has already defined for us what we think China is. Um, and so I, I don't know. I mean, this is a question that I'm, I'm interested in and, and I'm, I'm interested in kind of exploring is sort of how leaders, like what, what provokes leaders to kind of have transformational moments? Like, could there be a transformational discursive shift in the United, in United States foreign policy discourse vis-a-vis -vis China? Um, and what would it take to do that? Like, I think you saw that at the end of World War II in Europe, right? That the, the war provoked a kind of leap of faith that they, we have to create this thing called the European, well, that came to be known as the European Union. Um, you know, is there, is there, like, a, a, a Nixon China moment by a crisis? Pardon say, me? A, a, a Nixon China moment, perhaps. Yeah, exactly. Um, but I just have to, I wonder, like, what would precipitate that, right? What would kind of, yeah. what, what, what would force a radical rethinking of U.S. foreign policy toward China? And I'm not, I'm not sure, like, because I think we're still caught in this kind of 
containment engagement trap that, and neither one of those things recognizes China for what it is. Um, it, it, it sees either China folding into a US led international order and becoming like us, or, you know, needs to be eliminated and contained. And so I think neither one of those frames, and I think that's what kind of emerged with Nixon, where it's this containment engagement dichotomy. Um, yeah, and what would what would a kind of recognition based discourse look like and, and how would it come about? I think it's a tough question. Um, Biden's foreign policy has not given me hope that that is going to happen at any point in the next three years. Mm. If I could just close with one final question, and this comes back to the question about power transition theory. Uh, so please forgive me for this. But when we talk about power and power transition has occurred, uh, or not, the, you know, the, this kind of thing. I mean, is is the measurement of power is is sort of the appropriate measure? The measure of um, the actor at the time. So, for example, now you know, U.S. foreign policy elites, uh, for instance, think that a power transition is, is sort of occurring now, versus an analyst say ten years ago, uh, ten sorry, ten years from now looking back on this period and saying, oh yes, that was the period uh, because according to my economic model or whatever indicators that this has right. occurred. So in terms of, I mean, this goes to the whole question about sort of social construction of, of measurements yeah. of power and so forth. What your interpretation I, of that is, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I think it's a social construction. I think we don't perceive power accurately in objective terms. Um, and if you look throughout history, you see um, cases where states have been way more revisionist, let's say, in terms of taking territory, right? Um, the United States was a way more revisionist power than Imperial Germany. Like, we took seven times as much territory as Imperial Germany did during that time period of the turn of the 20th century. Um, but the U.S. was not thought of as a, as a revisionist power. Imperial Germany was. Um, and so I do think that our perceptions shape I think it's a total social construction. Um, although interestingly, Organsky and like whatever that book is called, right? He, he points to China and he says like China is the is the one to worry about, right? China is going to be the next big power transition. So yes, no, I mean he, he, well actually first it was China then India, uh, right. in, <laughs> in his book from the fifties on uh, world politics. Um, whereas actually he says you know the Soviet Union is not going to catch up economically, so you don't really need to worry about it. But. Right, um, right. Which is an interesting thing. But I mean, in realists always say, you know, I, I learned under John Mearsheimer at the University of Chicago, and, you know, he will always say, like, and even Waltz, right, states will balance, or, or Mearsheimer would say, the growing China threat, the growing China threat. Um, but there's never a precise, right, it's just always something that will kind of is on the horizon, it's going to happen, and then it happens and they say they're right, right. So I, yes. I kind of feel like, <laughs> Like, what if that language, what if that mode of thinking is endogenous to our perceptions of Chinese power in the first place, right? That, yes, that I mean, part of how it, we understand it. At the very least, there's always the prospect of a self fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, look, as it's uh, just uh, past 7 p.m. now, I'm afraid I will need to bring this session to a close. Uh, Professor Murray, thank you so much for a superb presentation, which I found. Uh, extremely interesting and thought-provoking. Um, you know, one, one comes across these references to status so often in the discourse of policymakers, scholars, think tankers, and I think more generally in American culture, uh, certainly in the media. I mean, to the extent that it's effectively an ideology that is both sort of conscious and and unconscious. And anyway, the way you tie this together in relation to Trump and and the actual implications of this, both at the time of his administration as well as in the post-Trump era. Or perhaps the sort of the post first Trump era. I guess we'll see what will be a second. Okay. Anyway, I thought it was very effective. So 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 thank you very much. Um, indeed. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. No, no, absolutely great pleasure. Um, just before leaving, I would like to briefly re uh, let you know uh, the seminar will be resuming again probably uh, sometime in the second half of February or early March with about six sessions running through June. So I look forward to seeing you then and wishing all of you a very pleasant remainder of the evening and, and a holiday break later this month. So uh, thanks again. Great. Thank you. Thanks.